What a great experience to see a standing room only crowd here. Uh, we are delighted to have the mayor of Sioux Falls, Paul Ten Hagen, here with us. And as you know, uh, the mayor, since taking over the city of Sioux Falls about a year ago, nine months, nine months, uh, he has given transformational leadership to the city. How many of you have heard 5G? Quite a few hands went up. And this 5G technology, it's going to revolutionize how we access information incredibly fast of speed. And Mayor Tenhaken has played a huge role, still working on this, bringing the technology to South Dakota and to the Sioux Falls area. And that's going to open up tremendous opportunities in terms of business growth, employment opportunities, career opportunities. It's going to put us on a global map. And, and, and the, the credit for that is just for this one single technology alone. It's not easy to get. Uh, and yet, uh, Mayor Tenhaken is, is able to bring that technology to the Sioux Falls and put South Dakota on the, on the global map. So that's just one of his many accomplishments in a very short period of time. So we are incredibly grateful to have Mayor Ten Hagen here with us today. And to introduce the mayor, I have Ashley Chawley here today. Where is Ashley? <laughs> Ashley, it's yours. Can I have a clap, please? <laughs> Okay, so good evening everyone. My name is Ashley Charlie. I'm a sophomore here at USD with a minor of, with a major, excuse me, with um, exercise science, physical therapy, and a minor of business. Um, so enough about me, more so the mayor now. <laughs> okay. We are very pleased to welcome Sioux Falls Mayor Paul Ten Hacken to the Beacom School of Business today. In May 2018, Paul Ten Hacken was elected mayor of Sioux Falls. In this role, he is leading strategic initiatives for one of the fastest growing municipalities in the Midwest. Before taking office, Ten Hacken established himself as a Midwest leader in the marketing technology sector. After spending many years in executive marketing position, he founded the marketing technology company Click Rain in 2008. He has won numerous national business and entrepreneur awards over the years, but his proudest accomplishment is his family. Tin Hacken is also the co-founder of the Dispatch Project, a nonprofit that organizes overseas mission opportunities for business leaders. In his free time, Paul is an avid athlete who enjoys competing in triathlons and obstacle courses, races, and volunteering with his church and community. So please join me in welcoming the miraculous mayor, Tin Hacken, to class today. Thank you, Ashley. This is on, right? Okay, great. First off, for those of you who are standing, you certainly can come sit on the steps here if you don't want to stand the whole time. So does anyone want to do that before I get started? Are you cool standing? <laughs> it's going once? All right. Well, super honored to be here. Um, this is a great looking group. I promise this will be a fun discussion and not some boring political talk. Um, Thanks to the Dean for uh, inviting me and for your great warm-up as well. Um, when, I, when I was invited to come speak to you guys, I thought about what I should talk about. Um, and what I specifically kind of landed on, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in Sioux Falls at the end, because I know a lot of you care about Sioux Falls. Who's from Sioux Falls in the room? Yeah, all right. Sioux Fallsers. Um, and I know you spend time in Sioux Falls, and you maybe hang out in Sioux Falls sometimes, so I want to talk to you about what's going on in Sioux Falls. But I also want to talk to you about how a colorblind graphic design major becomes mayor of a city. And I'll tell you my story a little bit, um, because uh, it could be one of your stories quite easily. I was never in my wildest dreams planning on doing anything related to politics or public service when I was in college. Uh, in fact, it was probably the opposite. Probably it's like some of you, you're maybe a little jaded on politics. You're sick of the fighting. You're sick of, we don't even know if the government's going to be open tomorrow yet. I mean, you're just sick of the crap, politics. And I know it seems like it's bad now. It's kind of always been this way. It just kind of swings a little bit. And when I was in college, there was fighting and there was problems. And I'm like, who would ever want to get into that? And here I am. And I want to tell you a little bit about how, how that happened. So, um, 
I went to Door College in Sioux Center, Iowa for graphic design. And um, I'm 41, so I graduated there in 2000 with a degree in graphic design. And I moved to Sioux Falls. And I moved to Sioux Falls. I grew up in Minnesota because Sioux Falls is where the action is. Um, Sioux Falls is, Dean, just, Dean and I just spent 45 minutes talking about how we can continue to collaborate between Sioux Falls and USD and look for opportunities for you guys in Sioux Falls. But for a lot of us, a lot of people my age anyway, and hopefully a lot of you, we want to be in a big city, have culture, have good jobs, but we also uh, still want to be close to families. And if, you have, if your family's from near, uh, you know, southeast South Dakota or South Dakota or Minnesota, Sioux Falls is a nice mix. You can have kind of a uh, more urban environment with stuff to do. You should be close to your family. That's what drew me there. And so from first eight or so years of life, I worked in marketing and worked at, it was Sioux Valley then, uh, and we became Sanford Health while I was there. And, and then in 2008, um, I started getting a little bit of an entrepreneurial itch. And I was working for a big corporation, and sometimes um, that's good. Sometimes you get a little frustrated working with a big corporation at the pace at which change happens. And, and I got a call one day from some, some one guy, and he said, Paul, um, I want to talk to you about a business me and some partners are looking at starting. And I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm kind of liking my job at Sanford, but I'll, I'll talk to you. And this was 2008. And so I went and met with these, these four people. And I'm going to probably end up drawing on the board. These four people, these four guys, had a business that secured government grants to create web-based health and wellness games. So under the George Bush administration, uh, George W. Bush, there was a lot of grant dollars to get kids to eat healthier. And back in 2007, 2008, there was this big technology called Macromedia Flash. Okay? Has anyone ever heard of Flash? All right. Thank you, has. Well, Flash was this platform by which you'd make games on, like, you know, this pre-apps, all this stuff, you'd Flash. And these guys would get government grants. This was a million-dollar grant. They would then pay a company $800,000 to do all the work build the game, create the app, or it's not an app for them, but create the application. Um, and then they would take $200,000 and they'd use that for the project management and that would kind of be their, their cut of the project. So what they said is, Paul, we want to start a company that we can send all that work to. So instead of farming it all out, we're keeping the 800, but that, that requires web chops and marketing chops and programming jobs, and we know you have that, and we're wondering if you'd be willing to become one of our partners in this. And I said, um, let's do it. So I, we started this company, and we were each 20%, and we decided to call this cl company ClickRain. And that's how ClickRain was formed. We were going to be a company that, that helps fulfill this grant work that this the, the parent company was getting. And I'm telling you all this because you will have opportunities when you get out of school here to get into partnerships and to do things and to get into business ventures. And I want, to, I want you to learn from a couple of my pitfalls which I've taken into the mayor's office. We started this company, I was 20% owner. Uh, the first year of the company, we got exactly this much grant money, zero. So, I'm here, these guys all have other jobs, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, we started this company, there's no work. Well, Paul, grant, grant work takes time, give it time, it'll come. And so I'm like, well, this is my job. I need to make money, I need to figure this out. So I had to start hustling, and I had to start doing other things to make money. So I was creating MySpace pages for businesses. Now, you've heard of MySpace, right? You haven't heard of MySpace. Used to be really cool. MySpace pages for businesses. The first MySpace page I created was for a political candidate. And that political candidate told someone else, oh, this guy knows his way around MySpace, and he'll create you a page. And I started doing this political work in uh, creating digital marketing stuff. And pretty soon, I was growing my, my portion of what was being done in the grant work that these four um, partners were to bring to the company. It wasn't happening. 
So a year and a half into the business, I approached those four partners and I'm like, guys, at the end of the day, I'm one-fifth owner of this company we started. I'm 20% owner. But I'm busting my hump 80 hours a week trying to get this thing going because this grant work isn't there. And they said, I want, I said, I want to either buy you out or I'm going to walk away. And so they said, well, let's get the company evaluated. We'll see how much, see how much this little click ring is worth. And the big lesson there was we did not have good buy-sell agreements in place. And a buy-sell agreement is so critical. Buy-sellment is like a prenup in a marriage. It basically says, if things go south, this is how we're going to divide things up. We did not have a strong buy-sell. I shouldn't say we didn't have a strong buy-sell. We did not have a buy-sell. So what that means is they would say, well, let's get the company evaluated, and then you'll buy it back for that. And I said, well, the company is kind of me right now. <coughs> I'm the company. So it's kind of worth whatever I say it's worth a little bit. Um, and so there, this is where business ethics then comes into play. So what I could have done is taken the company, shuttered it on a Friday, and on Monday started Click Thunder you know, with all the same clients, all the same staff, and there was no legal recourse the other partners could have taken. And it wouldn't have cost me a red cent. <coughs> Legally, it could have done that. Ethically not the right thing to do. Because ethically, I probably still would have been at Sanford Health. They hadn't called me and convinced me to do this, and I probably still would have been at my old job. So I had a moral obligation to them as well. So we did get the company evaluated, and I had to go to the bank. I had to take out a second mortgage on my house to buy my own company, is what it felt like. And it was super hard. It's hard to pay two mortgages anyway. It's doubly hard to pay two mortgages when you, you didn't have to do that, but you did it because you felt it was the right thing to do. We had a five-year payback on that, that second mortgage on the business, and we paid it off in nine months. And I say that, and the reason I say that not to brag, I say that because I'm a firm believer that if you make the right business decisions ethically and morally, you will never regret it. And the right things will happen. So our this was this was our growth path. Bought them out here. And we just hockey sticked from there. It just took off. And now this didn't exist anymore. Now I was I was the sole owner. And I could make decisions and we could go. And so for the last 10 years up until 2017, that was my life running this company called Click Crane. Uh, we grew that to 35 employees. It was about $5 million in revenue company. Uh, we did some work with USD. I think they still do some work with USD. Um, it was an absolute blast. But around 2012, about four or five years into the company, I had a chance to go to the Dominican Republic on a service trip through my church. And I went on this trip, and it was a super super heavy experience. I didn't really want to go. I kind of got forced into going. And what I experienced on that trip and the things that I saw and the people I talked to made me feel like a narcissistic, selfish jerk. I was, I was trying to grow this business, make money, build a personal brand, have a 401k, all this stuff that was so focused on me. And I went to a country and experienced some things that I knew existed, but until I smelled them and touched them and saw them, it was, um, it was something I had chose to ignore. And that weighed on me for the next four, four or five years of the company. As, we, as the company grew and things were going well, I kept thinking about the needs in other parts of the world. And so I started going to Haiti, and I go to Haiti every year. I went for the last six years now. And I kept feeling this tugging on my heart to do more, to serve more. And I was running from that calling. I did not want to do it. I'm like, this is, this is hard. I don't want to go be a serve overseas. I, I, I love people. I want to help people. But I am not wired to move my family and three kids and join the Peace Corps and like figure something out. I'm, it's not going to happen. So all this political work that I've done over the years, got me a lot of exposure to different 
candidates, issues, how politics work. And I decided I was going to run for the mayor of Sioux Falls. I said, I'm going to try and make impact on this city. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm probably not going to win, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with integrity. I'm going to make the right decisions. I'm going to model what servant leadership looks like. I'm going to just, I'm probably going to get beat up about certain things, and that's okay, but I'm, I'm just being called to run. So I sold my business, sold the company to some of my employees, uh, named a new CEO, Natalie Eisenberg, a USD grad. She's incredible. That was kind of transformational in and of itself because, unfortunately, in Sioux Falls, companies over 30 people probably count on one hand the number of companies that have female CEOs um, of 30 more people. So that in and of itself was really cool that uh, I had a lot of of males in my company, a couple partners, who I think also wanted to be the CEO. And so it was a very delicate dance for me to do some self, make them self-aware of what sort of leadership qualities we want and make everyone convinced that 